presentation is today's presentation is titled person and family centered care approach in managing falls in LTC. We are so fortunate to have with us two people who are passionate about today's topic. First, we have Nikki Mann. Nikki joined Villa Colombo Services for Seniors in May 1989 as a healthcare aide after completing her first year of nursing in order to experience nursing. She specialized in pediatrics and worked in acute care hospitals while continuing to work with Villa Colombo as an RN in charge. She is currently the Director of Resident Services. Nikki attended the McMaster Summer Institutes for Geriatrics and is Montessori-based dementia programming certified. She is also PCES trained. Nikki completed the leadership course from the Dorothy Wiley Institute of Learning and most recently completed the International Interdisciplinary Wound Care course by CAWC at the University of Toronto. She continues as the psychogeriatric resource person for the facility and is a certified crisis prevention intervention instructor. In addition, Nikki is on the faculty with Seneca College as an adult educator for the practical nursing program and clinical instructor for George Brown, Centennial, Ryerson, BSN Collaborative Nursing Programs students for first year placement. We also have this afternoon, Karim Kamani. Karim obtained his Bachelor of Science from University of Toronto and his Bachelor of Science in Physical Therapy from University of Western Ontario. Karim has spent most of his career working with geriatric populations, both in the community and institutional settings. Employed by Arvan Rehab Group, he has been an integral part of the physiotherapy team at Villa Colombo, Toronto since 2003. Dedicated to patient care in multidisciplinary settings, Kareem has co-chaired Villa Colombo's Falls Prevention Committee since 2006. So without further ado, it is a pleasure to present to you our speakers, Nikki and Kareem. Uh, thank you, Arlene, for uh, the introductions. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining and uh, participating in our session with us. It is with great pleasure that we'd like to share uh, the accomplishments and um, our successes that we've experienced uh, working with RNAO implementing best pa uh, practice guidelines at Villa Colombo. We are um, in our pre-designate state for our organization um, at our... Oh, oh, so, sorry. Um, so there are two um, best practice spotlight um, programs going on within our facility. The first one we're uh, in year three. Actually, we've uh, requested an extension this year simply because uh, we've had uh, challenges with pandemic, as I'm sure everybody else has, implementing our best practices and meeting our deliverables and objectives. So we are in year three with that uh, graduating next year. Um, and uh, for the OHT, we uh, are we're the first uh, long-term care facility within our Northwest Lynn to be the OHT uh, facility to uh, implement best practices. And this is our second um, best practice guideline that we are implementing. The first one that was implemented is uh, person and family-centered care. And now we're working on preventing falls um, and uh, injury. So it's with great pleasure that we'd uh, like to share our, our successes and what it is that we've been doing uh, moving forward within the organization and uh, take practices from previous and uh, grounding them and, and re-implementing them. So the learning objectives for uh, today, basically we had decided that, you know, it's it's really very, uh, I'm, I'm sure every facility, every organization knows uh, what it is that they need to work on. And what we try as an organization within um, Villa Colombo is to align them best with best practice guidelines. Um, and there are best practice guidelines for virtually everything. Um, so any gap that we identify, any quality project that we undertake, we align them with, with best back best practices and we ensure that we uh, get the most of and we're doing the thing we're doing everything the right way and ensuring that um, we're not repeating uh, projects over and over again so we do it the right way the first time and uh, 
in order to do that uh, uh, with RNAO, um, we've gone through many gap analysis and they give you guidance and um, an understanding in what um, the gaps are and identifying what it is that we need to do as an organization moving forward. Um, it gives us an opportunity to develop um, champions and uh, within the organization we have developed champions as uh, this champions workshop is uh, clearly uh, allowing us to disseminate that information uh, we've been able to pull our champions within uh, the organization um, to help support and uh, create change so uh, our champions are the change agents within the facility to support whatever uh, new ideas um, or challenges that we're uh, overcoming within the facility um, in order for any change to be successful, um, you have to be able to realistically measure it and set targets and goals. So we'll be going through that today. We'll also uh, share how we celebrate and recognize successes and how we in engage our staff in that. And um, we, as far as uh, I had said earlier, we need to always uh, develop a sustainability plan. You can identify the gaps, you can implement change, but as, uh, unless it's sustainable within the organization or, or for any project, um, it's not going to last long and uh, practices do dwindle backwards and go back to the previous state if not managed and sustained. Um, so we did go through a planning, uh, planning stage with uh, the, uh, by undergoing a gap analysis for preventing falls and reducing injuries um, within the organization. And although for RNAO for the second um, BPG, it was just recognized uh, early this year, we actually as an organization identified this as an area for improvement for ourselves last year, at the end of last year, and we conducted this gap analysis and we identified seven areas that we really need to focus on. Um, injuries uh, from falls and a better tracking uh, stats for us. Although we have a very robust uh, falls committee team where you needed to further delineate uh, where the injuries and, and the extent of injuries that were happening from falls that were going to hospital. Um, we recognize that uh, most falls uh, did happen on admission. So we're developing a brochure for the new admissions as well as uh, taking a deeper dive in the falls and recognizing within the four weeks uh, when the falls are happening and how they're happening. Um, because change of any environment does contribute to falls in the elderly. Uh, we're reviewing our falls uh, risk assessment tools along with policy, um, um, as well as the handoff of care during unit to unit transition or a movement that's happening within the organization. We are working with the team, medical team, uh, looking at bone, uh, bone density, um, dietary supplements and vitamins, um, implementing comforting rounds, as well as um, we've implemented the annual education for lifts and transfers for safety for all staff. Although these are the seven key uh, gaps that we've identified, we are focusing in. Um, this is always work in progress and we're just solidifying those areas. We are focusing on top three, which I'll talk about later. But the reason why we decided that we wanted to move forward with the falls prevention uh, forum for us is because uh, in long-term care facilities, we know that we're heavily regulated and we know that um, inspectors are on site. You do get issued orders, written notifications, or just a random inspections that are happening. And we know that when a resident does fall, a sustained injury or um, an incident happens, a critical incident is required to be completed and forwarded to the ministry. And basically these are red flags, areas of concern that the inspectors keep on their radar that will initiate either a call to the facility or coming in and doing spot visits to, uh, to review what's happening within the organization. Um, so these are areas that we really, um, really take seriously and we're really very um, critical on um, and recognize that uh, all the policies within the organization uh, are pulled at that time, practices, procedures that the staff are engaged in are reviewed um, uh, any education programs or review programs uh, or evaluations that are implemented are um, reviewed at that time, as well as resident care plans. Um, it's it's not it, it's it's a challenge. I can say sometimes to be sitting on the hot seat when you're sitting in front of an inspector talking about the policies and the programs and um, where are there some issues and uh, where we've violated 
um, and created some gaps and which may have contributed to the injury for the client. And that is uh, concerning for us. And we take every, um, every opportunity as a learning opportunity so that we can only improve and get, uh, make it better for here, Re make it better here for the residents. Um, and we know that when inspectors are on site, they are interviewing the interdisciplinary team, verifying the practices and any interventions that are implemented. So this is one of the, uh, another reason why we chose uh, falls because recognizing that uh, although we are doing wonderful work, uh, there's always room for improvement and we're just uh, working at it from that aspect. Uh, again, the three areas that we identified as an organization, um, out of the seven areas that we uh, identified, we're focusing in on the assessment tool. Uh, it's a Scott's assessment tool versus our Moore's fall assessment tool, because everything's always attached back to policy. And uh, there has been slight changes to that. So we're just reviewing both assessments and identifying which is probably um, the most strategic and the most uh, e uh, effective for the geriatric population that we're working with. Although we track uh, our injuries, there's a more focused approach to uh, identifying them post falls. Um, and we've, um, and I'll let Kareem speak about that at the falls committee level. We're also uh, tracking uh, all our falls that are happening post admission. So it's not just the injury itself, a post fall and the severity of the injury. It's also the post uh, admission falls that we're tracking that we recognize are happening, but we want to be able to um, um, quantify those numbers moving forward. So we've taken these three areas that we're really focusing on. I am going to hand it over to Kareem and he'll talk a little bit about the falls uh, prevention and least restraints committee. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, I'm just going to give a quick overview of our falls prevention program here at Villa Colombo and two success stories that have come out of it. Uh, at Villa Colombo, we have a multi tiered falls prevention program. And the program is overseen by a multidisciplinary committee that is comprised of nursing, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, pharmacy, and other ad hoc members that participate as necessary. The team meets monthly to review policies and facility protocols, strategies and recommendations, uh, analyze statistics, and it also conducts an annual program review and annual goal setting. For example, setting the target number of falls per month for the upcoming year or education goals or addressing any deficits identified by our gap analyses. At the unit level, there's a multidisciplinary fall subcommittee meeting that occurs monthly on each of our nine units, and that involves registered staff, PSWs, physiotherapy, nursing directors, and any other staff that have any relevant input, uh, for example, the activation or dietary or housekeeping. These meetings serve to address frequent fallers and residents that are at high risk for falls. Resident falls are reviewed in order to ter determine the underlying causes, implement resident-specific interventions, and also determine the effectiveness of the already implemented interventions. Uh, family involvement also occurs at this level, as recommendations made at these meetings are followed up by staff with families uh, in order to help facilitate uh, falls prevention. So requests for appropriate footwear, education to families about fall prevention, review of resident patterns of behavior that may be helpful in addressing falls. And finally, there are weekly huddles that occur on each unit. So these are led by registered staff for the nursing team and are designed to address all resident uh, and staff concerns, one of which is falls. These huddles allow staff to monitor the effectiveness of the interventions that are in place by providing regular feedback as well as new information or concerns. There are a number of tools that we use at Villa Colombo to reduce falls and injuries. A falls risk assessment is conducted on admission quarterly and with a change of status. And this assessment allows to determine a resident's level of risk based on that risk, appropriate interventions are implemented. And this is the one that Nikki mentioned that we are currently reviewing to determine which is the best to use in terms of best practice versus also following the, the policies and protocols that we are currently following. So. Uh, additionally, a fracture risk screen is done for all residents on admission and quarterly. 
When a fall does occur, a post-fall investigation tool is completed by the registered staff in conjunction with any other staff that has relevant information about the fall. This allows us to compile as much information as possible about the fall and allows us to put the appropriate interventions in place. An incident report is also completed as part of the risk management protocol and the power of attorney is contacted about the fall. And finally, if a fracture or laceration or other significant injury is sustained by the resident as a result of the fall, a critical incident is submitted to the Ministry of Health. At Villa Colombo, we're always looking to involve other dip disciplines when it comes to addressing falls. This could be restorative, it could be pharmacy for medication review, maintenance for environmental modifications, occupational therapy for equipment needs, dietary for new nutritional requirements, and our BSO team that is always coming up with new and innovative ideas, which leads us to one of our multidisciplinary success stories. We had a resident who on admission could not ambulate and required significant assistance to stand to transfer. She was very agitated and had a high number of falls due to her restlessness. Staff were reporting that she had significant behavioral issues. Physiotherapy was working with her to improve her mobility, but it was our BSO lead, Udit, who sourced the ultimate walker as a potential intervention for this resident after having ascertained that her restlessness was in fact an intense need to walk. The ultimate walker, as you can see in the picture here, is, um, is sort of an adult sized baby walker so that if the resident gets up and gets tired, they can sit back down on the bench and then stand up again and continue walking whenever they want. Depending on the resident, they may need a certain level of supervision or minimal assistance to use it. In this case, physiotherapy assessed that the resident could safely use the walker and with the BSO program in place and support from the regular staff, the resident gradually improved to the point where eventually she was walking independently on the unit with her own rollator walker. So that was a very nice success story. Another success story is a program that was adopted by the facility. We initiated a falls contest supported by our Van Rehab Group, our physiotherapy provider, in which the unit that does the best in terms of falls prevention every month gets the falls prevention trophy as well as a Tim Hortons coffee card for each staff member on that unit. This initiative has really taken off as it has created a little friendly competition between units. Sometimes staff will wait to talk to the incoming shift because they had a fall on their watch the previous day. This not only holds staff accountable, but it allows for some additional communication as staff would then suggest to each other strategies to prevent falls for a given resident. In addition, prior to the pandemic, staff would parade onto the win on the previous winning unit and have that staff shine up their trophy before handing it over. Overall, it's been an initi initiative that the staff have really taken to and has successfully contributed to falls prevention. I'll hand it back to Nikki at this point. Thank Thank you, Kareem. Um, wow, great success story. Um, so looking at it from a perspective of um, person-family-centered care, uh, our program definitely is person-family-centered care. It's not just about um, uh, our numbers that we're monitoring within the organization. It's about what else is happening with a resident that could be contributing to um, their increased number of falls. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe uh, this lady that um, Kareem has, uh, our resident that she's, he's talked about, um, is somebody who's definitely been uh, quite, um, quite has had numerous falls, frequent falls, um, and quite serious number of falls, to the point at which where we had to provide staffing to be one-on-one -on -one with her until she did get involved in this program and her agitation was best managed when she was able to walk, have her walks. So um, thank you for that. Um, for any program uh, that's implemented, whether it's falls or skin and wound or um, incontinence, um, there has to always be a pro, uh, there always has to be a plan to sustain those programs. Um, like with the falls, we are we're constantly moving forward to see how it is that we can sustain the success stories uh, um, 
further look at uh, the competition that's happening between the staff and fine tweak what it is that we can do and get suggestions and ideas from them. But as an organization, I mean, everything that we do, it, uh, it all has to come down to, uh, a pol is there a policy in place? Develop a policy. We have to uh, provide a annual education for all, not just the frontline staff, but for all disciplines. So they're all involved um, in ensuring that the residents are safe. We have our monthly falls and least restraints committee. Um, and that's part of uh, not just legislation, but it's something that uh, we, we have to do. And if it's not just a, at a monthly level uh, for the facility, we do it at a, uh, as needed uh, for the organization, should anything come up, we'll call them ad hoc as required as well. There is, um, for every committee, you should be developing objectives and establishing goals as I'll be moving forward. And I'll show that we've established goals and every year we come to do a program evaluation at the end to see if we've met those objectives, met those goals and what our next goals for the upcoming year would be. Keeping in mind that, um, keeping in mind that we're able to, uh, you know, if we're able to uh, achieve our previous goals and what it is that we want to do moving forward. So that's at a facility practice. At a unit level, it's like Kareem had said, we do our weekly huddles um, for the residents who sustained a fall, evaluate the interventions for effectiveness. There's interdisciplinary monthly team subcommittees uh, that are happening at the um, unit level. Uh, all this information is rolled up and discussed at the bigger a facility committee uh, meeting. Uh, there's assessments that are done. Uh, they identify root causes. There's a post fall um, a tool that's completed. So you always, at the end of the day, you want to get back to what contribute, what caused the fall, what can we do to remove that uh, cause, and how is it that we can prevent that fall from happening, as well as updating the plan of care. Uh, there are weekly, monthly. Um, reviews that are done of the resident transfer and the and equipment audits that were created and in place. Uh, I talked a little bit about setting targets and monitoring them. Um, I'm very visual, so I kind of need to see what happens within the organization. And I know this is for last year, the team had established uh, 55 falls per month for the whole facility. And for, uh, and I, I'm sorry, I should have said this on the onset, we are 391 beds. So we have 391 residents within the facility. We are huge. We have nine units um, and uh, uh, setting a goal of nine, 55 falls per month uh, it's quite a feat for us when a few years ago, I would say we were at 65, Kareem. I think we, we had established, we had started at 80 falls per month and we've kind of come down to 55. So we've been uh, lowering uh, the number of falls per month and really setting stretch goals for ourselves. And we've been actually quite good at being able to achieve them. As you can see, although our target was 55 um, for each month, we we're other than one, two months, we're below the target. Um, and I'm sure uh, we're gonna be setting the target even lower uh, this year. But uh, nonetheless, we always need to set targets and monitor them closely, um, and, and we do. Uh, this is just another way that we monitor falls uh, from quarter to quarter. Uh, and I'm sure other organizations do the same. And at a quick glance, we can see that our falls from um, quarter four of 2019, 169 to quarter four of 2020, 124, that um, all the interventions, everything that we're doing is quite effective because we just see from over the one year that drop that's happening. We monitor our restraints as well. Um, as well as skin issues, any critical incidences. So this is just a, a how we keep a, keep an eye on what's happening. We, we report this into our PAC, Interim Quality and Risk Committee, and um, and just keep that uh, on the radar. Did I press it? Okay, sorry about that. Um, again, here's just. Um, so it, internally, we monitor through the professional advisory committee. We uh, monitor the falls, uh, the number of falls that are happening, fractures that happen as a result, um, and any pathological fractures as well, because it's not just a fall that'll cause a fracture. It'll be an, um, the age 
uh, of the resident, any um, di osteoporotic diagnosis that are there. So we're very uh, clo uh, we're very uh, close in keeping an eye on that because we look at bone density, we look at vitamin uh, supplements as well. Um, so this is just another way of uh, in internally monitoring that data. We look at the number of falls that are happening, but it's not just the number of falls, but it's the number of fallers as well. So you can see a, a 2020 Q2, um, we had 123 falls, but there were 80 residents that, uh, you know, uh, that created those 123 falls, not 103 residents. So we really break it down and um, track that, uh, as well as number of factors that are happening. Lacerations as well, we're monitoring them because sometimes lacerations do result in residents needing to go to the hospital to get suturing happening. And again, at that point in time, because it's a change in um, their ADLs, a critical incident a report gets filed and uh, another uh, a red flag for uh, the ministry for us. Um, and we've developed a monitoring um, structured, and this is just for because we're um, we're monitoring ourselves through becoming a best spotlight organization, but also because uh, we're accountable, and ultimately we're accountable for um, everything that we do um, to the board as well. So we have our. Um, our leadership, our IPAC, our skin and wound, all our committees at the bottom, and they roll up into larger committees, um, which are monitored uh, through our um, through our board representatives, uh, through our leadership, uh, through our continuous quality. And then we put our RNAO uh, monitoring team right in the middle there uh, because we want, to, we want to touch everything that has to do with quality. So although it is our best practices that we're monitoring, we're also touching on everything else uh, when it's related to quality. And we're making sure that we're getting the best and we're doing the best and we have interventions and uh, plans that are uh, setting the team up, the residents up for success and, um, and decreased number of incidents that are happening. Uh, whether it is skin and wound, whether it is falls, whether it is responsive behaviors, ultimately we uh, put these in place so that we can decrease uh, the numbers and and increase and better our um, our overall statistics. And uh, this is just our monitoring structure that's in place. I think we may have uh, missed a slide there, or maybe I was slow with that. But we also benchmark against the province, and uh, when we look at uh, at our provincial benchmarking, we are actually, I can't see that, I'm so sorry about that. But overall, uh, we do use uh, the provincial uh, data to compare ourselves against. Although we are much better uh, than the provincial average, we still always look to see how it is that we can continue to improve. Um, so the residents are getting uh, the exceptional quality of, um, of, of life that it is that we can provide for them because we know one fall can be that one fall that results in a fracture, results in hospitalization and results in pain, wounds, issues um, and emotional distress for the residents. So ultimately um, we're all encompassing to the care that's required and provided to the residents. Um, and that's how we take our falls program and we engage uh, everybody in it. So it becomes a uh, person family centered care. Is there anything you would like to add, Karim? No, I think we have a question and answer table. Well, uh, that's the end of our presentation. Uh, we're open for question and answers at this time. Um, thank you very much, Nikki and Kareem, for your brilliant and very educational presentation. Congratulations on your implementation efforts that have now become staple to your practice at Villa Colombo. Um, I was disconnected for a while, so I'm not too sure whether uh, the first question was answered. But um, the first one I've seen was, what fracture risk screen do you use? No, fracture risk. Oh, sorry. Uh, the fracture risks tool that we use is is the one from um, the MDS. We get the rate, we get the number that's coming out from uh, the MDS score. That's that's what we use. Thank you for answering, Nikki. Yes. And here's another um, question. So someone stated they like the idea of the ultimate walker, but wondering if it would be considered as a restraint. No, okay. Can you hear me okay, Eileen? 
Arlene? Yes, Kareem, I can hear you, yes. Okay, great. Uh, that's a great question, actually. I think with any, anytime you have any kind of mobility device or any device of that type, you have to consider that. Um, in our case here, it was implemented as an intervention that was used as part of specific programs. So we never had a resident independently using it or left alone. Every time the resident was using the ultimate walker, it was either with supervision from the physiotherapy team or the BSO team, or with a one-to-one -one, uh, assistance from a, a staff member, which meant that it was not considered a restraint because there was always somebody with the resident. If this uh, intervention ended up being something that would be used independently by the resident so that Maybe you have a, a facility that could allow for, for you, you do need a lot of space to use it because it is quite a wide walker. But if you have the, the physical space to use it and a resident that might be appropriate to use it on their own, at that point, I believe it would, cons would count as a restraint. When we're looking at the, the definition of a restraint being that a resident would have to be able to undo the restraint on command it's not that easy to open and get out of. And so I, my guess is it would probably have to be considered a restraint, but that would be based on your determination as a facility. Thank you very much for answering that, Kareem. Um, so the pressure is off now with you and Nikki. Just wanted to let you know that we have about like 92 participants. So great um, uh, turnout for today. Um, Andrea, I would like to pass it on to you uh, for questions, please. Yeah, so there was quite a few questions we have, so we can start to go through them. Um, someone was just asking what the name of the adult type walker is. It's called the ultimate okay. ultimate walker. Perfect. Um, one just came in. How can we implement hourly rounds? In our home, we were using hourly checks and hard copy for PSW to sign each hour once they complete the rounds. It's not working for us. That's a struggle. That's a struggle. And um, what we are currently part of, um, what we will be implementing is um, uh, comfort measures, comfort rounding. We're not there yet. And hourly rounds are, they're difficult. So Safrina from another organization, I know it's a challenge. Um, but as we're working through the comfort rounds, we'll, um, I, I would say I'd like to come back and redo this presentation and be able to answer that question at that point in time, um, because we know with uh, with pandemic, it, it was a struggle and it was difficult. And despite the staffing issues, um, you know, the hourly rounding uh, is, is hard. It's really hard. Um, and even if we have the staffing in place, how to do it, it gets very difficult. And I know the signing off is a struggle as well. I guess for us as an organization, we have a point of care. Uh, we have a POC. So we have point click care and we have point of care. So the tablets for our PSW, so there isn't paper documentation. They carry it with them and it's happening in real time. And even that, uh, when I go back and review, I know it's not... Uh, as well as it can be, but it's still nonetheless uh, another alternative that's available is um, electronic documentation. And I know that's hard. It, it's financially, it's uh, difficult. Great, thank you. Um, next question is, do you provide education to the residents and their family on falls prevention? We do um, have supports and it, we provide some education uh, and we, in the past, what we have had are uh, family education nights where we do provide uh, uh, different topics and what we're providing education on. Um, but what, as I had identified earlier, uh, as an organization, one of the things that we are doing is putting a brochure together um, so that we hand it out at admission and we provide that information at the first four week uh, conference that's held. Uh, with the families to have those discussions. I know the families are involved as far as having those conversations with the, with the team at the unit level when falls do happen and uh, gathering that information and identifying what some of the triggers may be and what some of the interventions may be uh, as far as uh, being successful um, prior to coming in and brainstorming and putting that plan together with families here. But as far as uh, uh, specific education around falls, um, no. Uh, but uh, it is something that we've identified as a gap for the organization. 
is there anything you'd like to add to that screen? Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, next question is, how did you set the goal of 55 falls per month based on what benchmark? <laughs> yes. So, so we did start uh, about three years ago. We, we started tracking falls a long time ago and uh, up till about three years ago, we were still having a high number of falls. We were up around 80, 85 falls a month. And as we started increasing our interventions for falls prevention and upgrading our, our program, we noticed that we were starting to become more successful. Just by, by tracking the stats, we started to see that the falls came down. And so we were trying to pick a number for a target that was obviously below where we were at, but but also reasonable. We're realistic. It realistic. has to be realistic. And like Nikki had mentioned, what we were doing is setting a, a target number of goals uh, of falls within a stretch goal as well. So, for example, when we were at uh, maybe around 60 falls per month uh, a few years ago or two years ago, would have been when we set the target of 55 goals, with our stretch goal being 50 goals or with 50 falls. So it, it does fluctuate and it does depend on the situation. So as we were improving, we did lower our goals. What we found is when we had set this, the goal of 55 with a stretch goal of 50, we were actually meeting those, that target, of the stretch goal target. The only two months we didn't were the ones where we were in the heart of our outbreak during the pandemic here. And then we brought it right back down after. What we did do is we, we set the next goal at 50 for this year. And what we found is we're struggling a little bit to meet that goal in large part because we have so many admissions and that's a very hard um, resident population to manage, manage in terms of falls. So we may or may not meet that, that goal this year, but it does fluctuate in terms of, I guess, the, the general situation within the home. Um, there's just a question of what makes a faller? What's the definition? A faller, a faller is what we, we would call a resident who fell. So when you're doing your stats, um, you're going to have a stats for the number of falls. And then we're also collecting, so we're, we're sorting those falls by resident. So you may have 10 falls on a unit in a given month, but maybe seven fallers, meaning that some of those residents would have accounted for more than one of the falls. I'm not sure if that answers the question. It's like frequent fallers. You have a resident that um, like uh, who may have uh, fallen four times. Um, so th th those, but that one resident accounted for four of the 10 falls. That's just a different way of saying what you just said, Kareem. Thank you. <laughs> Um, do you do bone mineral density on all of your residents? Um, we have looked at, you know, our, with the population that we work with, the ger uh, geriatrics, I mean, it is a struggle and it is difficult um, to do bone density. And really, the doctors don't own bone, uh, do bone density. It looks like Nikki uh, might be a bit frozen on her end, so we can just give it a few more seconds to see if her connection works out. So it looks like we've lost Nikki, um, but that's okay. So there are a few more questions, but what we will be doing is providing the slides to everyone in an email with um, that had registered and we'll provide the slides and the email address for Nikki. So you are able to contact her um, to answer more of your questions. Arlene, did you have anything else? Yes. Yeah.
Um, unfortunately, uh, because we lost this, uh, we lost connection. Um, we're um, having this, um, putting this webinar to an end. Um, uh, thank you, everyone, for taking time out from your day to take part in this webinar. As what Andrea had said, you will soon receive a link to. Um, you will soon receive a copy of this presentation. And also you will be receiving a link to an online survey to evaluate today's presentation. And if you could just please let us know if of any suggested topics you would like us to work on. And immediately after you have done the evaluation, you will receive your certificate of attendance. And please know that this, is, this work is funded by the government of Ontario. So again, thank you for joining us today. Have a very amazing afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. Oh.